Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 5. What he did was he got off the boat and started walking partially up the hill from the bottom. All right? People came to, to meet him. They sat in rows of hundreds and fifties, right? How many people? Let's say the first feeding. How many? Times it by four. Because men were, men were only counted, not women and children. All right? Say there's about 15, 20,000 people sitting here. This is a natural theater. It's a natural theater. You can literally sit here, and if a person walks up this hill at a certain time during the day, so that's the goal on hikes, just on the other side. At a certain time during the day, there's a wind that comes down like a funnel through this area. So if a person walked partially up this hill and started speaking at a normal tone to everybody, his voice would project with the wind coming from his back. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And being that this is a natural theater, everybody would be able to hear him. Now, um, it was once possible, you remember we were taking a look at that road, there was a fence up there? Well, the nuns are the ones that put it up. The nuns that watch over the... Uh, because they didn't like the idea of groups coming here and walking over to the side right by those eucalyptus trees. They wanted people to come on their property because it costs money to go up there. Get the pay to get in. And many groups, like for instance, Calvary Chapels and others, would sit down and do their teaching right underneath that eucalyptus tree. And the pastor would walk halfway down the hill, turn around and, re and read the Beatitudes. And everybody can hear them. But now they put a fence there, so we can't do that. But in any event, this is a very good view right here of uh, where the event took place. And he began to teach them, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit. Someone who is poor in spirit realizes they are spiritually bankrupt. As Isaiah said, all of our righteous deeds are as filthy rags before the Lord. No matter how good somebody is, they are not good enough to go to heaven. Nobody is good enough to go to heaven. All have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. And your own works can't save you if our righteous deeds are as a filthy garment. If that's our righteousness, nobody can be saved by their own works. John the Baptist was the greatest man who ever lived according to the law. He was the epitome of human righteousness, possible through religion. Jesus said, none born among women is greater than John. Yohanan Amatbil. But he who is least in the kingdom is greater than John. What did he mean? In Jesus, through the new birth, we have an imputed righteousness. We get the righteousness of Jesus. He takes our sin and pays the price for it. The wrath due our sin is poured out on Jesus, and he gives us his righteousness, the just for the unjust. So our righteousness is not our own, it's imputed. He who is least in the kingdom, the one who was born again into the kingdom of God, is greater than any standard of righteousness you can achieve through religion. It doesn't matter if you're the greatest humanitarian who ever lived. It doesn't matter if you're Albert Schweitzer. It doesn't matter what you are or who you are. You're not good enough to go to heaven. Your righteous deeds can't save you. The only thing that will save you is being poor in spirit. To know that you're completely bankrupt spiritually and you cannot save yourself. You must realize you're impoverished. Otherwise you can't be saved. Secondly, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This has many implications, but on the most practical level, the Hebrew term is to mourn the heat of hell. In time of a death of a loved one or a friend or family, people become acutely aware of their own mortality. There are people who will consider their own eternal destiny during the time of a death of a loved one more than at any other time. Now he says, those who mourn shall be comforted. He's talking about those, of course, who are mourning the death of a loved one who died in righteousness. But people are more open to spiritual things at times of death. But let's continue. Blessed are the gentle or the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meek is not weak. Meek is not weak. Jesus was indeed meek, but he was not at all weak. The way he stood up to the religious establishment, he called the clergy of the day a generation of snakes. He said, how dare you call any man father? He was meek, but he's not weak. To a woman at the well, to a woman caught in adultery, he could be very gentle and forgiving. 
to religious hypocrites who are misleading the people, you generation of snakes. Just think of the term gentleman. I personally, different people like different sports, I like rugby union. Well, in England with the class system, rugby is considered a gentleman's game. In fact, it's a roughneck game. It's much rougher a game than soccer, than football. It's rougher than cricket. It's, but yet, it's for, for, for reasons of class distinction in, 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 in English culture, it was known as a gentleman's game. There's nothing gentle about it. But public school boys play it, but Oxbridge guys play it. <laughs> well, it's like that. It may be a gentleman's game, but it's a rough game. Jesus was meek, but he was never weak. Let's continue. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be satisfied. The world gets uglier and uglier. We've got a situation now where people, just in England, a few months ago, the last thing, for instance, the British Prime Minister Tony Blair did before leaving office, his last piece of legislation was the sexual orientation regulation. If you will not take a little infant out of a crib, out of a pram, and give it to a same-sex couple to be brought up as a homosexual or a lesbian, you will be arrested for a hate crime and criminally prosecuted by the British government. I see these injustices. I see the BBC. The Jerry Springer Opera at Christmas time, Jesus Christ is a little bit gay. They wouldn't dare say that about Mohammed at Ramadan or any other time. Sorry. Makes my blood boil. Yeah, the of all the people running for presidents of the United States, every major candidate is a baby killer. Everyone is pro-abortion. Everyone will compromise on the homosexual issue. The day before yesterday, President Bush said all religions pray to the same God in an interview with Al Arabiya TV. President Bush is a liar. The man is a liar. Yes. Remember, in Texas, everybody's born again at election time. Muslims do not pray to the same God as we do. No way. The man is a liar. It makes me angry. It makes me want Jesus to come back. How can you do this to these little babies to bring them up in a homosexual? We shall be satisfied. Because of these things, the wrath of God will come. But we have to know, it is only because of the grace of Jesus, the wrath of God is not coming upon us. Let's look at the next one. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. No matter what anybody did to you, no matter what you have against somebody else, God has more on you. <laughs> He's perfect, we aren't. He's more than willing to forgive. If we repent and ask Jesus to forgive us, he's more than willing to forgive any of us, including me, a cocaine dealer from New York. He was willing to forgive me. One condition, I trust him for the grace to forgive others. Whatever somebody did to you, don't worry. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. What's in store for them is far worse than anything you can devise. Better yet, that they would repent and be saved. Because other than that, we'd be on the same route to judgment they are. Hate the sin, love the sinner. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This draws on the Hebrew concept of tahor and lo tahor. In Greek, catharsis and akatharsis. Something could be 98% pure, 97% pure, 96% pure, pure in heart. Ephesians uses this idea of catharsis, Ephesians 5, among other passages, there's also a passage in Corinthians, to explain it, and it explains it in terms of human sexuality. If you pick somebody up in a discotheque and you're not a believer and you sleep with that person, it's pure lust. There's no pretense of anything else. I love me, I want you, that's it. But suppose two young people are attracted and they really do fall in love. They really are actually in love and they get engaged, and they really are planning to get married. Suppose they fall into sexual sin. Suppose they, instead of consummating a marriage, they fornicate, commit fornication. Well, we really are in love. We really are planning to get married. I really do love her. I really do love him. There's a mixture. That is what lo tohor means. That is what a catharsis means. It means it's a mixture. No, you didn't make love to her. You violated her. If you married her, love is a commitment. 
Then you made love to her. No, you gave yourself to that man. Sorry, darling. He's not your husband. It was not an act of love. It was a mixture. Pure in heart. Pure in heart. It's not what you do. It's the motive you do it with. You smack your kids in anger. That's wrong. You correct your children because you care about them and there's no choice of the, no other way to keep his finger out of the electric socket. <laughs> you do what you've got to do. Unless you live in Sweden, you're supposed to let the kid cook. It's against the law to... <laughs> Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. This is not talking about politicians. There will be no real peace until the Prince of Peace comes. Amen. We must understand about peace. We've explained this many times. The Greek word for peace is where we get the girl's name, Irene. Irene. Irene in Greek. It means an absence of conflict. The way I point it out is Dr. Samuel Johnson sardonically described it in his dictionary in London in the 18th century. Peace is a period of preparation and deception between two wars. <laughs> Biblical peace is shalom. Jesus said, Shlomi lechem lo olam. My peace I give you, not like the world. Hallelujah. Shalom comes from the infinitive of the Hebrew verb, shalom. leshalem. To pay, to fill, to fulfill. To pay, to fill, to fulfill. We have shalom because Jesus the Messiah came to pay the price for our sin, to fulfill the Torah, the law of God that no Jew and no man could keep, and to fill us with his spirit. We have shalom because the Messiah came to Le Shalem. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, preaching the gospel of peace. peace. Ephesians chapter 6. Shod your feet with the shoes of the gospel of peace. God has his peace plan. Rick Warren has his. Rick Warren's peace plan today is an acronym. P is for partnering with churches. E is for education. A is for assisting the sick. C is for caring for the poor. And the other E is equipping people with his teaching. Notice there's no evangelism. Now God's peace plan is evangelism, witnessing, seeing people get saved and discipled. Hallelujah. Given the fact he has two E's in his peace plan, you think at least one of them would be evangelism, but it isn't. He has a social gospel. Christians do not do good works to get saved. We do good works because we have been saved. Now, most of you know us, our ministry, we run orphanages in Africa for AIDS babies. We don't do that to get saved. We do that because we've been saved. It is not our righteousness. It's the righteousness of Jesus operating through us. We love those kids, yes. But more importantly, we love those kids because Jesus loved them. This is the difference. You can be in the biggest conflict of your life and have shalom. Now ultimately, his shalom will include the absence of conflict. When Jesus returns, there will be a millennial reign of Christ. He will reign from Jerusalem. It will include the absence of conflict. The nations will indeed beat their spears into pruning hooks. It will include the absence of conflict, but that's not what it is. By being saved, you can have shalom right now. The world will never have a true and lasting peace. The Antichrist will bring a false peace. He'll attempt to bring a false peace to Israel, but it will always be a false peace. Let's continue. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's not nice being persecuted for righteousness. I was just in Indonesia a few months ago where the Muslims have burned 3,000 churches to the ground in the last three years, CNN and BBC don't care. God cares. I know people who have been persecuted for righteousness. <coughs> I have seen people, I've known people, men of whom the world is not worthy. That they're just so filled with Jesus. I knew people like Richard Wormbrand, people who suffered tremendously for their faith. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. That is the kingdom of heaven. Am I supposed to believe those who are persecuted for righteousness don't have any faith? Well, if I believe Jesus, they have tremendous faith. If I believe Kenneth Copeland and Kenneth Hagin, they don't have any faith. 
You don't have to suffer. You're a king's kid. Blab it and grab it, name it and claim it. You either believe Jesus Christ or you believe Kenneth Copeland, but you can't believe both. Either Christ is a liar or the money preachers are liars. One of them are liars, one's telling the truth. That sounds harsh. Come with me to countries where Christians are persecuted and tell them you don't have to suffer, you're a king's kid. I've seen what happens to people who are persecuted. I was just with a sister in faith that they locked her up for over two years for giving milk to hungry Muslim children. They said that she was, that she was trying to give them milk to convert them to Christianity. They locked her up for two years and one month with no food. Her daughter had to walk 20 kilometers every day to bring her something to eat because of her faith. How dare these money preachers say, you don't have to suffer, you're a king's kid. Maybe they don't have to suffer because they're not king's kids. They are of their father, the devil. Yeah, that's right. But let's continue. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. When you stand up and tell the truth, the compromising church is going to persecute you. Jesus warned about that, the same as he did to the prophets. Sometimes I go on the internet and I do a search of my own name. I discover things about myself I didn't even know were true. I, I discovered that I believe things and teach things that I've actually taught against. It's amazing. It's incredible. Now we have to understand something. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salt, salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under the foot of man. Yes, I was indignant about the homosexual adoption and lesbian adoption laws in England. Yes, I'm indignant about the BBC. Yes, I'm indignant about an American president who calls the religion that beheads Christians a religion of peace. I'm indignant. But you know what? The real fault are not the crooked politicians in Whitehall and Washington. The real problem are not pornographers, homosexual activists, lesbian activists, abortionists. The real problem is the church is no longer being salt and light. Why wouldn't they insult Islam the way they insult Christ? Because Muslims will stand for their faith. The Laodicean church of the Western world has become too lukewarm. The salt is losing its taste. Now let's understand something. Jesus gave the Beatitudes, eight of them. These are called Bruchot. He was teaching a synagogue formula. In a synagogue, you have the 18 benedictions called the Shmona Esrei. Jesus was a rabbi teaching in the synagogue formula of the Bruchot, of the blessings. Okay? Later, the rabbis would add something called the Bekat Minim a blessing that was effectively a 19th in about 90 AD. They put a curse on Jewish believers in Jesus and they pray that the name of Jewish believers in Jesus will be blotted out from the Book of Life. Certain ultra-Orthodox Jews still do that. Quite a thing, they pray that my family's names will be blotted out of the Book of Life because they believe in their Messiah. Well, the blindness of the Jews, it's a tragedy. But what do you do about the blindness of the church? When my wife was first saved, she's Jewish, she's the daughter of Holocaust survivors, she witnessed to an Israeli guy named Sassoon. Once she showed Sassoon that Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies, he got saved. For a Jewish person, that's basically it, showing that Jesus fulfilled the prophecies, then they understand the gospel. But then she tried to witness to some Arab Catholic girls. But Jesus is the Messiah, oh we know. But he rose from the dead, oh we know. It was their religion, it was their culture, but it was not their real faith. The way Satan has been able to blind Jewish people is an incredible tragedy. But how can he blind Christendom? How can you have a situation where they will pave over the road that Jesus walked on to park buses so you can pay money to go in to see a church built by a dictator? How can he blind Christians? To think salvation will come by praying to the dead or through some ritual, instead of by trusting in the one who took our sin to give us his righteousness. Quite a situation. In Jesus' day, the rabbis were legalistic arguers. Remember the verse, the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life? Yes. It had two meanings. 
The letter killeth. The purpose of the Torah, the purpose of the law, was to show we're condemned. The purpose of the law that God gave Israel was to demonstrate through the example of Israel and the Jews that we can't save ourselves. That religion doesn't work. If it worked, they wouldn't have needed a sacrificial system to make atonement for the fact that it didn't work. The only religion God ordained was Old Testament Judaism that no longer exists in 70 AD, and its purpose was to show through the example of Israel that we can't meet God's standard. We need a Savior, a Messiah. The letter killeth, but when you're born of the Spirit, the Spirit giveth life. Amen. That's the meaning. What the rabbis were doing was playing legalistic games with the letter of the law. Jesus always interpreted the letter of the law in light of the Spirit. You lust after somebody's husband or somebody's wife. As far as God's concerned, you slept with them. He interpreted the letter in light of the Spirit. You hate somebody. As far as God's concerned, you've murdered them. You can hate what they are. You can hate what they do. In self-defense, you might even have to kill them. But I'd much rather see a Muslim get saved and get killed. The best believers I've ever met in my life are people saved out of Islam. One of the spiritual highlights of my life are the few times that I've led Muslims to Christ. They're the best believers I've ever met in my life. The letter killeth, the spirit giveth life. The rabbis played legalistic games with the letters. Jesus interpreted the letter of the law in light of the spirit.